Hi, I'm Kevin Hartley and welcome to Kevin Hartley Photography in my office. This is a channel that I've set up to share my experiences of wildlife and nature with others. So let's go. Most wildlife in the field will be able to hear, see or smell you long before you're able to see them. Wildlife senses are far, far superior to the human senses. Therefore, what you've got to do as a wildlife photographer is make sure that you ut utilise your human senses, your sight, your hearing, your nose, to as much of an advantage as you can to try and get as close to your target to photograph. It's one of the most basic skills that you need as a wildlife photographer is to be able to get as close as you can. Ask yourself this question. What's the most important piece of photographic equipment that you own? The answer, well, my answer is the most important piece of photographic equipment that I own is my eyes um, and my ears and my nose. And it's all, this is what this video is all about, is utilising your, your human senses to try and get as close as you possibly can to wildlife to photograph them. So what I want to do in this video is share with you my approach to observing wildlife and what we'll do is we'll look at how to observe wildlife, we'll look at methods to use to photograph wildlife and we'll look at the senses that we have that we have to pit against wildlife out in the field. What I also want to do with you is to share you a tip which cost me about two pence which I think is about five cents in, in, in dollars and it involves a paper clip. So if you stay with me throughout the video, I'll show you a great practical tip by just using a paper clip that will allow you to acquire a target through your lens very quickly. Now, there's a number of ways that we can get close to, to, to wildlife and some of them don't take a lot of effort. Some of them do take a bit of effort. And the things I'm talking about are things like static hides that you'll find on the likes of nature reserves where you just go in, you sit down and you let the wildlife come to you. Other things that you can use are things like pop-up hides. I have a pop-up hide which I use uh, for, for out in the field and I think it's an absolutely brilliant piece of equipment. Uh, it takes seconds to set up and it's very comfortable. Um, you can th use things like bag hides which are very portable, fit in your, the, the, the back of your jacket. You can deploy it within a matter of seconds, uh, especially when you're walking about um, out in the field as I've said. And the last one is personal camouflage. Do you have to wear personal camouflage to get close to, to wildlife? No, no you don't. I wear this stuff because I'm very comfortable in it. I spent 24 years in the military, so I'm very comfortable wearing this and I wear it all the time. And what I'm gonna do is, in my next video, which is the, the third part of my wildlife series, I'm gonna look at field craft skills. So that's something to look forward. What you're looking at now is a typical scene of countryside here in the UK. When you're identifying uh, subjects from the ground, what, what I suggest you do is you take your view and you split it up into thirds. So it's just like the rule of thirds when it comes to composition of photographs. So put a grid line over the view that you've got and then divide those thirds up into left, centre and right from left to right and then from top to bottom go near, centre and far. So that's your grid. Left, centre, right, near, centre, far. And then what you need to be doing is you need to be systematic when you're looking at your view and start from the, the, the left at the bottom, come across to the centre, come across to the right, come up, come across, come up and come across. So you're being systematic in your, your, your observation. One tip that I would give you is that you should never be that confident that there's nothing right in front of you. Uh, and that's why it's important to start at the bottom. All right? You never know what you could be under your feet or under your nose um, when you're observing. Learning to use your eyes is one of the, the most basic skills that you need as uh, a wildlife photographer. Human eyes compared to, to wildlife, wildlife's vision is far, far superior to ours. Human uh, angle of view that we have is about 120 degrees. For something like an eagle, it's 200 degrees. And for a deer, it's 220 degrees. So in, in effect, deer can, and, and, and eagles can slightly see behind them. 
Now, as I said, human eyesight is about 120 degrees. You then have to, to take that 120 degrees and it actually comes in narrower and narrower. We have a thing which is called peripheral, peripheral vision, which is on the, the, the outside, which we which isn't in focus, we can't really see it, and it's only really movement or noise that directs us to uh, that subject that's in a peripheral vision's view. And actually our field of vision in front of us is about 60 degrees. Yeah, so that's what actually what we see in front of us is about 60 degrees. And then when it comes to what's actually in focus, that then comes down to about 30 degrees. So give you a little exercise. All I want you to do is, and I'll pause a little bit, is focus on something in front of you. Extend your hand with your finger pointing upwards and bring it in front of you. And then focus on it. And just see how much outside of your finger is out of focus. And that's how the human eye works. And it's important that we understand that. We then take that on to the next step is that we've actually said that we have a 60 degree real angle of view. When we focus on things, it brings it down to 30 degrees. Then when we actually start using uh, photography equipment, it gets even narrower. And what we'll do is I'll show you this slide here. Typically, as wildlife photographers, we'll use lenses in the range from a bit between about 100 up to 500. And what you'll actually see that as the focal length increases, the field of view narrows. Yeah. So when you're getting out to something like 500 uh, millimeter focal length, your actual field of view is quite narrow, and that's very difficult when you're using long lenses. I mean, this is an 800 millimeter lens. So when I'm trying to find a subject with my lens upwards, it's very difficult to to actually find it, and that's where the paperclip trick comes in. And that's what I'm going to cover next. Okay, what I want to do with you now is share with you a little tip, a little trick that, 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 that I've discovered. Uh, I haven't seen anybody else use it. Uh, it works for me and I hope that it works for you. And it's all about when you're using long focal length lenses, this is an 800 millimeter lens. When it comes, remember I talked about your, your field of vision, how narrow it gets. How often do you find yourself trying to, to get onto your, your, your target and you're like this, you're all over the place. Now, this is a fixed lens, which means I've got no option. It's not like a, a zoom lens where I could zoom, zoom out to 100, find my target quite easily, zoom in on it. So, what I do is I call it the paper clip trick. All, right? All it takes is a paper clip, nice big paper clip, bend it at 90 degrees, and then fit the paper clip under your lens hood. So it sits on the tip of your, your, your lens hood. And then what you're looking to do is line up the tip of your hot shoe with the paper clip and the circle that you have. And what you're looking to do is look across the top of the, the hot shoe and get your target inside the paper clip, like this. So you're down, looking through, looking across the top of the hot shoe, get your target inside the paper clip, and then all you have to do is just bring your eye down, and the target should be there or thereabouts. And I find it a great method of acquiring targets with long lenses. Try it. If it works, let me know. What I want to do is, is give you a phrase which goes as follows, absence of the normal and presence of the abnormal. So what does that mean? Well, it's a phrase that I learned in the military and we used it for observing in the field to try and identify targets. And this, this principle, if you understand it, is great for um, actually trying to observe wildlife. And I'll explain it to you as follows. So, what do we mean by absence of the normal? If you take the slide that you're looking at now, um, you've got a herd of sheep in a field going about the, the business. That's that, that's quite normal. Everything is normal. There's, there's nothing that stands out. So we, that's what we're expecting to see. Or it could be that you're, you're walking through a wood, which is full of bird song, uh, which is great to listen to, and nothing sticks out. It's just quite normal. That is what we mean by a, a, a normal situation out in the field. Now, it's when that becomes absent, 
So things that we expect to be normal are absent that we need to be switched on that something is going on. So what we're actually looking now is for something that's present which is abnormal. So what do we mean by that? So what we're actually, things that are, that are abnormal that stick out in the field when we're observing are things like shapes, sounds, shadows, silhouettes, other animal tracks where there aren't normal animal tracks that can guide you towards your subject. So it's really about absence of the normal and presence of the abnormal. So what we're actually looking for is things that are abnormal. Okay, well, what methods are we going to use for, for observation? Well, I use a mnemonic STOP. S-T-O-P. And that's the method that I use for observation and I'll explain that to you. In fact, I can just hear, and here you go, this is, this is great, I can hear a raven and I hope it comes across on the video at some time. It's flying about in a field just opposite me. I can hear it, I don't know if you can pick up my video but I hope so. But quite apt because this is what I'm covering at this part of the video. So back, so I use the, the, the mnemonic STOP. So we'll start off with the, the first letter S and what does that mean? It means stop. And when you stop you need to be looking and listening to what's in front of you. You need to make sure that you utilise all your senses. You're looking with your eyes, you're listening with your ears, and even using your nose. So what you need to do is S, stop, look and listen. When it comes to listening, it is a very critical observation skill, especially uh, when we're photographing birds. As I said, you know, I, I've heard a, a raven in the background. I know it's called, so I know that there's ravens here. And I'll, I'll, I'll put a picture up so you, you, can, you can see what a, a raven looks like. So listening is a, a critical skill, especially as I said for bird photography. You know, bird sounds tell us that there are birds present, just like, the, the, you know, I now know that there's a raven around here because I've just heard it. It can indicate where the bird is. I heard the sound over here, so I know that there's a raven over in that direction. One critical sound that, that, that's important to learn and understand is certainly the bird call, but bird alarms as well, because they're great indicators. Birds, birds um, if they're alarmed, are great indicators that something else could actually be present in the area. So it's important to, to listen to bird song carefully, and if you want to be uh, a really good wildlife, wildlife observer, I would advise you to try and learn some basic bird calls to begin with, and then take it from, from there going forward. It's a great skill. Okay, going back to a mnemonic stop, we come to the the, the second letter, T, what does that stand for? Well, T stands for think about time. Think about the time of the day and think about the time of year. The time of day is important in as much as that lots of uh, wildlife are more active first thing in the morning and last thing at night. Hares especially that I've found are crepuscular, which means that they tend to be more active uh, at first light and at last light. Think about the, the, the time of year and the seasons don't think that you can go and photograph an osprey here in the UK in the winter. It's just not going to happen. Ospreys are, are, are spring, late spring and, and, and summer visitors to the UK. So you need to understand the, the time of year and what wildlife will be around. Again, autumn and spring are great time of years for, for migratory birds coming into, and, uh, into the UK in the winter and then leaving in the spring to go back to the, the, the summer grounds where they came from. And another one is, is grouse. I've just spent uh, a month up in the Peak District. I'll leave a link to the video that I did for that on photographing grouse. Best time of year to photograph grouse is in the summer and in August. Why August, do you say? Well, August is when the heather is in full bloom. So, T, think about the time. We then move on to the next letter and stop, which is O. That's all about observation and being an observer and not a watcher. Observation is not just about using your eyes. It's about using all your senses to, to give you an indication of where the wildlife is so that you can get closer to them so that you can get the photographs that you're after. Think about using different pieces of equipment. Binoculars, scopes and cameras. And don't forget the Mark I human eyeball, the most important of them all. That's the most important piece of equipment that you have for observing wildlife. Using our senses to, to try and find wildlife, there's lots of things that are not just in front of us, above us and to the side, but actually down on the ground. Things like animal droppings, 
do you know the difference between a rabbit's dropping and a hare's dropping, uh, for instance? Well, the difference is the size, really, and texture. Do you know how to identify tracks in the ground? Do you know the difference between a roe deer and a red deer? What happens if you come across a pile of feathers you, that you see on the ground? Obviously, there's been a, there's been a kill. Uh, something's killed it and something, but do you know what's actually done that? Do you know how a fox consumes a wood pigeon compared to how a sparrowhawk consumes a wood pigeon? Well, the answer is that if you find a pile of feathers and all the quills are intact, that means that that bird's been plucked. I said plucked. <laughs> and that's likely to have been a sparrowhawk, because what sparrowhawks do is they'll, they'll pluck the feathers out before they consume the meat, whereas a fox will actually rip them out. Right, so you get lots of broken feathers where a fox has ripped the feathers out of the wood pigeon. There's lots of ways of being able to observe wildlife. Okay, we come to the final letter in a mnemonic stop, and that's P. And what does that stand for? Well, it stands for patience. And great things come out of patience. Don't rush, take your time. If you're sat nice and comfortable, <coughs> excuse me, in a hide, just be patient, take your time. Be quiet and listen very carefully. It's not just about what you see, it's about what you hear. If you do have to move, make sure that you move slowly because nothing will give you the game away the, the, the movement and making a noise in a hide. What I want to do now is I just want to kind of finish off with a bit about smell and how important that is when it comes to, to wildlife observation. Wildlife have a far, far, far greater sense of smell than human beings by a mile. Animals like otters, badgers, foxes and deer will, will smell you from a great, great distance. Always be aware of the wind direction, if possible. And try and always approach wildlife from downwind to observe them. Another little bit of advice is, if you're going to go out and observe wildlife, don't put on any perfume or aftershave or deodorants. It just gives the game away. Okay, what I want to do is kind of bring everything together and, and summarise it in a series of photographs that I took of an otter on the Isle of Mull. I was fortunate that I went on holiday to the Isle of Mull a couple of years ago. If you've never been, it's an absolutely fantastic place. Uh, one of the things that's always been on my bucket list from a wildlife photography point of view is being able to photograph an otter. And that's one of the reasons I went to, to, to Mull. So what I want to do with a series of photographs is just explain to you how I got the photographs and how important observation skills are and, and using your senses to get the photographs that you're after. So, went to the Isle of Mull, a uh, fantastic place. As we said, otters, fantastic sense of smell. They don't have very good uh, eyesight, but they do have good hearing as well. When you photograph an otters, you need to be at ground level, as you do with, with, with most birds that are, are, are ground-dwelling animals. Initially, what I did was go back to presence of the abnormal. I was scanning the water, which was kind of flat calm, and then all of a sudden, there's this little black blob in the middle of the water. Abnormal. So straight away, binoculars out, looked at it, and sure enough, it was an otter that was fishing out uh, in, in the distance uh, in, in the sea. So I, I kept watching it, and I watched it fishing away, and then it was catching small fish, and what otters will do is they will, they will consume the fish out in the water. Now, ideally what you're looking for is an otter catching a, a larger fish, and if it catches a larger fish, it will come into land, and sure enough it did. Now, what I then had to do was I had to make sure, checking the wind, that I was in a position whereby, hopefully, fingers crossed, that that otter would come near me. So taking the wind into account, I made my approach. Now, what you're looking for with an otter is, if when an otter dives, you've probably got up to about 20 seconds before it resurfaces. Otter dives, move, keeping a low profile, get down on the ground, otter comes up. It gets closer and closer and closer, and then eventually it did come onto land. And I just picked my final position, laid still, uh, and then hoped for it to, to come closer towards me. And, and then it did. And it was one of the greatest wildlife encounters of, of my life, and it's something that will, will, will stay, stay with me forever, um, was the fact that that otter came so close to me. Uh, and that was all down to using my observation still, skills of looking, listening and using the wind direction and my nose in order to get close to that otter and I'm sure as you can see by this sequence of photographs it was well worth it. Okay thanks for watching this edition of Kevin Hartley Photography 
and the wildlife series and observation skills. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have um, making a video and bringing it to you. And as far as I'm concerned, if only one person learns something from this, then I've achieved my aim because that's what my channel is all about. It's about sharing my experiences of wildlife and photography with others. All I would ask is that if you've liked the video, could you hit the like button? Could I also ask if you haven't subscribed to my channel to consider it, it's completely free, it doesn't cost anything and what it does, it just keeps giving me that encouragement to keep coming out here into the English countryside and share my wildlife experiences with others and I'm very pleased to say that I've now just hit the, the 1000 plus subscribers which I'm really pleased about. So thanks for watching, stay safe, take care and I hope to see you soon. Bye for now.